Um, our last uh, speaker this session in the morning is Dr. Monique Ernst from the National Institutes of Mental Health, and she's actually one of the real pioneers in getting us to focus on this period of adolescence. Monique. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Bea and Brad, uh, for organizing this. This is like incredible, but a great idea. Um, so I was going to make a joke on the pirates, but I think you, you lost, so I thought, I don't want to stop like yeah. this. But I did <laughs> stop like this, so don't get depressed. Um, <laughs> So today I'm going to talk about the strata of functional connectivity across age and with a special um, interest in adolescence. Okay, now this is not like this. All right. So I'm going to do like a small review, even though we talked about uh, this, some people may not have a big picture, you know, the overall picture of connectivity. So we have billions of connections which are really enclosed in our small box here. Um, but these connections are organized. So this is like the beautiful DTI pictures, structurally and functionally. And I think it's interesting to think about this um, metaphor of the brain being, being a complex network and like, you know, the airplane uh, traffic. And so the traffic in uh, DC is going to be really different qualitatively and quantitatively from the traffic in Miami or in Montana. You're going to have the same, not the same people are coming and going, they're not doing the same thing. Same thing with the brain. We have different type of traffic and different type of uh, 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 qualitative thing going on. Um, sorry. So, and there are two types of functional connectivity, basically. One, resting state, which is booming, which is task independent. So some people say, ah, that means nothing. I mean, you cannot use uh, this uh, data because you don't know what they mean. Some people say this is really what's wonderful in terms of resting state because you don't need this task to mess up with uh, your interpretation. And so resting state is a coupling in slow spontaneous oscillations, and we are starting to understand what these slow oscillations mean. And then we have activation-related connectivity, task-dependent, and those are changes in event-related activity. So in a way, here on the top, you have this uh, resting state activity. So this is slow oscillation, so over 10 to 100 seconds, repeated for over six minutes, and you see how region A correlates with region B. And then for the task activation, obviously you have also the same type of uh, correlation of time series, but as a function of the event. So it's really clearly uh, associated with, um, with the event, with the task, the psychological process that is going on. In terms of analysis, you have hypothesis-free analysis. Uh, we talked about that, graph theory, independent component analysis. I think one of the big difference between these two analyses is that graph theory, you get met metrics of this uh, complex network, network. You know, a little bit like, you know, some more flavor of uh, qualitatively different uh, or aspects of uh, this network. And independent component analysis, it's more just correlation. And then you have the hypothesis dependent data driven analysis, and basically those are, those are seed based networks. And this is what I'm going to present today, and particularly based on the striatum. Why the striatum? So we know that it's a central structure for motivated behavior of course doesn't work in isolation, so that's what we're gonna talk about. And we know from the talk that we just heard and uh, from everybody else here that uh, there are changes in the function of the, of, uh, the societal um, activity across age. And you can see with this little uh, funny drawing, I think funny, 
that you know, motivation changes across adolescents. So more specifically, you have change in emotion, motivation, cognition, motor activity across age. But what's interesting is that, oh yeah, it's gonna be interesting later. Uh, so this different, uh, this different aspect of motivated behavior are reflected at the level of the, of the organization of the striatum, right? And so this is a node seminal uh, work by um, Alexander DeLong Streak, uh, 1986, um, showing that they were part, that was their theory. They didn't have, I mean, they had some data, but it was basically that the, uh, an intuition that uh, there was these five loops uh, across the striatum connecting with separate uh, regions of the, of the uh, cortex and that were segregated functionally. And then with more data, uh, and particularly with uh, Susan Haber, it appears that you know, in terms, they are segregated, but they are integrated too, and the word integration is really important. Um, and also, they actually, the striatum is actually organized as a gradient. So there are several types of gradient that have been described. I'm focusing on the ventral, ventral medial versus dorsal lateral striatum. I think that's probably one of the most uh, accepted uh, gradient-like uh, organization of the striatum. And so as you see, there is some functional uh, dissociation with more emotional limbic type activity with the ventral medial striatum and more cognitive motor with the dorsal lateral striatum. And so if we go back to uh, our change in these different processes, uh, here with emotion motivation, we have more of the ventral striatum uh, going on and uh, maybe some kind of quadratic uh, relationship. And we saw some of these, uh, some of the data suggesting that that might be happening uh, not only in the striatal activity, but in the connectivity. That's what I'm gonna talk about, right? And then for the cognition, it's probably more linear. And uh, like, for example, uh, Sylvia Bungay told us about this linear uh, relationship with um, reasoning, with age. So let's see. Um, we, uh, we actually framed our study after Adriana Di Martino, who's part of the team of Macmillan and Javier Castellanos, uh, because they had this uh, beautiful study uh, looking at functional connectivity of the striatum as a function of different uh, regions, and these regions were uh, identified using, um, um, I forgot their name, Da, 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 and Dagger, 2006, <laughs> uh, sorry about that, um, who, uh, so they did a meta-analysis of 25, 126 uh, functional studies and look at these different uh, regional co-activations. Uh, that's another way to kind of talk about uh, connectivity. Basically, they have these uh, six Cs Three seeds are more ventral, medial, and three seeds are also medial. I'm just showing you there uh, two of each. And uh, you see that the ventral striatum is highly connected to the orbitofrontal cortex as expected, and the dorsal striatum connected with the uh, premotor motor cortex as expected. So that's one of these uh, really nice dissociation uh, that's been shown with this study, shown with other studies as well. Um, in our study, we have 106 healthy individuals, really healthy individuals, like we do at NIH, uh, 9 to 44 years old. Um, just as uh, an aside, we had, we had to uh, withdraw 60 individuals because of movement. So we were really careful, given uh, you know, the great importance of movement. And most of them were children. Uh, six minute scan, seed based analysis, striatal ROI, the Macmillan pipeline, and we use um, FWE corrected crystal wise thresholding, <coughs> the, the usual. 
So now I'm showing you the map, just the map like uh, Adriana uh, study, which is the connectivity across the whole sample age corrected. Uh, so ventral striatum, dorsal striatum. By the way, we use the three ventral, ventral medial seeds that she had as a mask and the three dorsal lateral seed as a mask. And so again, here this is interesting, we see again this uh, high connectivity, positive connectivity with ventral striatum, but interestingly a negative connectivity of the dorsal striatum with the uh, orbitofrontal cortex. So most interesting is to see whether head to head, what's the difference between these two types of connectivity. And um, in green, this is where the ventral uh, group is higher than the dorsal group in terms of their connectivity. And as expected, you have the orbitofrontal cortex and you have the uh, um, dorsal in anterior cingulate. And then for the uh, blue, those are the connectivity that are stronger with the dorsal than ventral striatum. And as expected, you have the um, motor cortex and you have also the uh, insula. So now, this is the crux of the study in know, uh, what does age do between nine and 44 years old. So blue, negative correlation, yellow, positive correlation. Those are our maps, so what happens. So ventral striatum and dorsal striatum. Ventral striatum, we have a decreased connectivity with dorsal anterior cingulate, decreased connectivity with insula with the ventral striatum. And with the dorsal striatum, we have increased connectivity with the posterior cingulate cortex. So this is really very, uh, very selective, um, really strong, and uh, we were wondering where is our OFC? It's not there. Um, in terms of the pattern, so we wanted to have a more discrete, refined uh, idea of how this, uh, this um, correlation moved across age, and so we extracted the data and we uh, binned them by age. <coughs> and so for the anterior cingulate, you see that there is this peak at 14, 17 years of age. So there is overall decrease, right? But then you have this peak at 14, 17 years old. Same thing for the insula, and, uh, but it, not for the left insula, it was there for the right insula. So something is happening in adolescence. So that was good. Uh, and in terms of the dorsal striatum, it, it was like uh, just linear, although it's interesting that there is this, uh, this break here between 14 and 17, whether it's really negative, uh, negative activity uh, uh, connectivity while at 18, 24, it becomes no connectivity or positive. So, you know, I still wanted to look at the OFC or the MPFC, and so I, I'll show you this. Nothing, there is, not, there is really no uh, correlation with age in the ventral striatum with OFC. Um, so when we look at our emotion motivation and changes with age, uh, it seems that the underlying, the striatum connectivity uh, show this peak, uh, but just with the dorsal anterior cingulate and the insula. Um, and I'll go more into what I think could happen. And for cognition and motor, uh, we see this uh, linear relationship. So the patterns work, the regions work a little bit, we'll see. Now it's one study, very small sample of 100 subjects. I exaggerate here. <laughs> so um, first of all, in summary, we show this segregation of ventral dorsal striatal functional coupling. Um, so with the ventral striatum, 
we could think that the ACC is actually really well positioned to translate emotion into action, right? I mean, the entire singer received a lot of uh, uh, affluence from the uh, striatum, including ventral striatum, and also projects to, the, uh, to other regions of the cortex, including motor cortex. So maybe, maybe this um, peak in connectivity during adolescence between the ventral striatum and the, uh, the cingulate region is associated with this increased drive, increased motivation, increased strength of drive. And uh, I'm looking at Ron Dow because that's, I think, one of his uh, really new concepts. And I think, if I understand, and maybe this is something that could uh, underlie uh, this uh, thinking. Maybe there is also less flexibility in drives, you know, if you have this really strong um, connectivity. Um, now, the overall decreased connectivity, and, and so with the insula, maybe it's stronger autonomic influence on motivation. So that has implications for anxiety, sensation seeking as well. So maybe we have, you know, this association with risk seeking and sensation seeking. And also striatum, the PCC is a very important area that uh, is coming up a lot in a lot of most studies. Uh, it's part of the default mode network. Um, it's associated with internally driven cognition and broad attention focus, and maybe it has something to do with uh, social, you know, the social reorientation that happens during adolescence, which is a quote from uh, Eric Nelson here. Um, and so those, do you remember the first uh, day? Uh, the, those are the uh, changes that uh, Jay Gid outlined that happened during adolescence. Um, and now I want to thank James Porter, who did the, the analysis, Monica Luciana, who uh, unfortunately is not here, Amy Roy from the uh, NYU group, Danny Pine, Brenda Benson, and Dana Rosen from NIH. Thank you. Right. Yeah, it, well, I think it's a, it's a great interpretation. I mean, I, you know, I talk about maybe this lack of flexibility in the drive. And so you have two things that you said, you know, this flexibility and this sensit differential sensitivity to loss and reward, like uh, Jim was saying. Um, maybe, so here it is, right? We don't have any, I don't have in this study behavioral correlates. So I need the behavioral correlates and uh, um, we have some, but not in everybody, so that's a problem. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, where um, 